from the East Texas Sports Network studios, powered by Texas Dairy Queen, a tradition of excellence, the ETSN podcast, where Clint Buckley and Mike Graham offer their, offer their, well, they just talk. It's the lowdown on everything high school football in East Texas. And now, Clint Buckley and Mike Graham. Everybody's in district now, and there are a ton of huge matchups on tap for this Friday night. Welcome to the Week 7 edition of the ETSN.FM podcast. I am Clint Buckley, and I'm joined, as always, by Mike Graham. What's up, Mike? Hey, just happy to be here. This um, this Friday night's going to beat the heck out of fall camp and, and summer football and, and spring football and things like that. I'm, I'm really excited about the, the point of the season we're in right now. Yeah, and we got a ton of matchups to talk about, and I guess we'll start with maybe the biggest game of the year in the entire area up to this point, and that is Longview against Marshall. You know, we, we both kind of circled this game on our calendar at the beginning of the beginning of the year, thinking that this could be a big-time matchup. Both teams could be undefeated in district rolling into this one, and it turns out that's the case. Longview and Marshall, the oldest rivalry in the state of Texas. This is the 105th all-time meeting between Longview and Marshall, and this should be a packed house at Maverick Stadium on Friday. Yeah, they just announced um, on Wednesday that they had sold out the entire stadium. That's a, almost a 10,000-seat stadium and, and one of the nicer ones in East Texas, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm jealous that you got that game. Yeah, well, you know, um, you know, I, I've yet to attend a Longview-Marshall game before. Uh, you know, it, it's been so rare in recent years that this game has meant so much, but I'm telling you what, I I think this I know Texas High is also undefeated in, in District 15 5A, but I but I think that that the winner of this game gets the inside track to, to winning the district championship. That's definitely a fair point, considering the bodies of work so far. Marshall romped and stomped everyone until it met Pine Tree, and I'm sure we'll dive into that game a little bit. And in Longview has looked great, you know, even against uh, C. E. Bird from Shreveport, um, a one possession loss. Looked very competitive and um, has the tougher strength of schedule. So we're going to find out who's the better team and um, the rivalry connotations in it. Yeah, it's definitely the the best game so far in the East Texas slate. You know, I think the big matchup this week is going to be how how Marshall runs the ball against Longview's defensive front because uh, you've seen Longview a few times in person, as have I. They, they do a really good job against the run game. Um, you saw them against John Tyler, really held them down uh, against the run. I saw them against Lufkin at the beginning of the year, and Lufkin had a really tough time uh, picking up yards on the ground. And uh, that's what that's what's been Marshall's mo so far this year. Um, you know they have you know good passing numbers. They're very efficient when they do throw it. But everything you know kind of starts with that that two back tandem in the backfield, Cam Haller and and uh, Chavis Mills. No doubt. And you know even against C.E. Bird, Longview played well. They had to defend a triple option that night and and handled it and would set themselves up for success on uh, late downs, third and fourth down, uh, and, and then give it up. Probably <laughs> I can remember at least three plays where they gave up. Um, one extra yard than than they, than CE Bird needed for the down and distance, and I think that's the battle here. Um, you've got to set yourself up for success on third and fourth down, and you've got to capitalize on those um, advantages. But it's not going to be easy with Cam Holler and Chavis Mills back there. They're um, both explosive. Cam Holler already has 18 touchdowns this season on the ground. That's crazy. an amazing number through five games. Absolutely crazy. Well, I mean. The, the big the big thing about this is is how these two teams are coming into the game. Uh, Longview has had no trouble in their first two district games. You know they they took care of Pine Tree sixty one to six two weeks ago. Last week they they took care of Greenville fifty one nothing. Only allowed six points in two games. Now while Marshall began district very impressively with with a huge win at home against Hallsville last week, um, you know it really wasn't there for them. You know it was a, it was a struggle uh, throughout. They never really had a huge lead in the game against a team that they probably should have dominated in Pine Tree. Uh, ended up winning only thirty five twenty eight. Now. Uh, do do we want to chalk chalk this up to maybe them looking ahead to this week against Longview and, and kind of overlooking Pine Tree a little bit? I think so. Just on my drive home uh, for, from my game last week and hearing that score on the radio, I was thinking, oh, man, Coach Harper, while it was stressful in that moment, he probably did a little fist pump in his office because he knew that he had the guys um, after that one, that they, they weren't too good to play Pine Tree. Pine Tree um, gives them a scare, and they the team has to realize that there's room for improvement. And um, what better time to improve than ahead of your biggest game of the season yet? Yeah, and I think you know up until that point, Marshall really hadn't been tested uh, all season long. Uh, all of their games have been blowouts, and um, I guess if there is a silver lining to probably playing their worst game of the season last week, it was it was that at least Coach Clint Harper got to see his team react 
under adverse situations. And uh, they're probably going to be facing some some adverse conditions against Longview on Friday night. I know it's a home game, but Longview, I mean, they've heard all this stuff about Marshall being back and being, you know, being rejuvenated. And, you know, they kind of liked, you know, what this rivalry had become over the last few years. You know, them just kind of kicking the, the stepbrother in the shins, you know, for the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. And they're not ready to let Marshall, you know, come back and, 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 and get a win in this series. Um, so this ought to be a lot of fun. Uh, kicks off at 7.30 Friday from Maverick Stadium, Longview and Marshall. Now, another big 5A game is in the uh, the district right next to that one. 16-5A, John Tyler against Lufkin. For the second straight, uh, second straight week for John Tyler, uh, they will be playing an unbeaten team in district, and it's the only such matchup of 16-5A this week between two district unbeatens. they got to go down to Lufkin. It's going to be tough. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Lufkin, the, the fun stat to throw out is that they're averaging 1.5 points per game. They allowed three against White House. Uh, Boy, divide divide that by two. I mean, yeah, it, this is going to be a tough one for JT, but they did have to go up against a, a pretty fantastic defense last week uh, in Lindale. Lindale's defense was one of the best I've seen all season. And, um, you know, up, in, up until John Tyler. Uh, finally got ahead in that game um, midway through the fourth quarter. It looked like it was Lindale's game to lose. Uh, unfortunately, their offense couldn't battle back and, and give that defense a, a second chance at life. But yeah, um, you saw John Tyler's offense develop uh, quite a bit in that game. Dontavian Gross got into the action, the senior receiver, 100 yards. And, and that's big because um, the strength of their offense is their passing game. And to see Bryson Smith step up and, and make some throws in that game was impressive. And then um, I think they found a back in the process to, to help him um, get the load off himself uh, running the football for JT. Yeah, and that's going to be a big key, I think, this weekend is, is, is how well JT runs the football. Uh, you know, they're, they're, their passing game has weapons, obviously. you got Damian Miller, you got Dontavian Gross, and you got the quarterback, Bryson Smith. They can throw the ball, and they can, and they can hit defenses with big plays over the top for, for touchdowns all day long. But I think in a game like this where Lufkin probably comes in with the better offensive unit as a whole, and, and the most explosive out of the, out of the two out of the two teams, I think John Tyler is going to have to work the clock a little bit and, and kind of string together some drives and, and kind of burn some clock with with the ground game. And and while you know they don't have one guy that that really leads the way as far as a uh, as far as a running back goes, I mean they have a, they have a handful of guys. Whether it's Trey Allison, whether it's Kadarius Henderson, whether it's James Allen, who we saw some last week. Or uh, Dewan Bell, even. I mean, they have they have some some guys they can hand the ball off to, and, and they're really going to need a big time performance uh, from the running backs this week because you know that Lufkin's defense is going to key on Bryson Smith. They're probably going to spy him, make sure he doesn't make plays with his feet outside the pocket, and they're also going to do a pretty good job of of putting the clamps down on Damian Miller. I think deep downfield, they're not going to want to get or let Miller loose. Uh, on their secondary and Lufkin's secondary has been really good uh last week I was really impressed with Lufkin's defense uh the week before you know they shut out Nacogdoches uh, held White House to three points and they were like 34 seconds away from shutting out White House and it would have been White House's first shutout loss since 2005 yeah so I mean that tells you you know how well Lufkin's playing on the defensive side of the ball I think Lufkin will be able to score uh and move the ball pretty pretty well Friday night against Lufkin JT's just going to have to be able to match him. And I think the way they match him is not necessarily with big plays over the top and getting quick quick scores. I think they're going to have to burn some clock and, and manage manage time and if they want to if they want to come out on top. I completely agree with you. Um, I don't think that Lufkin's offense is going to do them any favors. Um, and, and I would put John Tyler's the underdog in this game, especially since it's at Lufkin. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a it's an important game for for really both teams because uh Ennis has White House and we expect Ennis to move to 3 and 0 this week. Um and and one of these teams will will join them uh, atop the district standings. Either John Tyler or Lufkin as both are 2 and 0 in league play coming in. Now on to 4A and man, we've got three tremendous 4A games to talk about uh Let's let's jump right into it and, and talk about uh, a huge district 7 4A Division 1 opener between Paris and Liberty Ilo. Um you know, these two teams, uh, they're, they're, they're almost mirror images of one another. Both have dynamic uh, playmakers at the quarterback position, and both have been through some wars over the last couple of seasons in the playoffs. Paris knocked off an undefeated Van team uh, in the first round and, and went a couple of rounds deep in the playoffs. And then Liberty Ilo kind of struggled through the regular season but was able to find it right before the playoffs started, went on this long winning streak, got all the way to the state quarterfinals. A couple of one-loss teams, Paris only losses to Argyle, 
and Liberty, Liberty Ilo has only losses to Gilmer. So, I mean, these are probably two of the best 4-1 and one teams in the state that you'll see at the 4A level. And it's uh, exciting to see them go at it right off the bat in that district. No doubt. Uh, and it's going to be lots of fun to watch Liberty Ilo's defense develop because um, Paris quarterback Quez Allen was one of the best I saw last year. Um, just a dynamic player, especially running the ball. Um, he's a guy that reminds me of Bryson Smith, but he plays on the 4A level. So um, lots of problems for, for a normal team. But I think Liberty Ilo's got the defense that, that can kind of keep him in check. And with an explosive offense, I think they go point for point with Paris. Yeah, and I think this is a big game for, for both teams, similar to John Tyler and Lufkin. Pittsburgh's in this district, too. And, you know, they have a game, I believe, against North Lamar this week. And we expect Pittsburgh to keep winning and move to 6-0 and in the year. So, I mean, for, for whoever loses this game, I mean, if, if they want to have a chance at maybe getting back into the district championship chase, they're going to have to beat Pittsburgh down the road, and that's not going to be an easy feat. It's, you'd be a lot better off winning this game and then, and then, uh, you know, playing your cards, you know, as they're dealt when you when you get Pittsburgh later on in the season. Another big uh, matchup in 4A Division One is an 8-4A, and that's Van and Athens. The last couple of years, these two teams have battled it out for the district title, and uh, it could be the same again this year. Yeah, these two teams. Um, in fact, just going back to, to what you're talking about in in the Paris and uh, Liberty Ilo division, you know, one of these losers, if Pittsburgh keeps on winning, they're going to face either Athens or Van, and and these are two very good teams. Um, Athens came in and, and we we looked very favorably on them um, with with Logan um, Logan Fuller, you know he's already at 953 yards, just a bowling ball back, um, playing in a winged formation offense, um, just just powerful. And, and last year when they met, it, it was indeed for the district championship, and uh, they gave Van their closest game in, in the Vandals' perfect 10 and 0 regular season, 35-32. Uh, it's just going to come down to defensive stops um, for Van to, to give their offense a chance because Athens in the running game and, and running the clock is, is going to limit possessions and make Van have to be efficient on, on every drive it has. Um, the good news for Van is that they've got some explosive players in their defensive front. They have a ton of tackles for loss, and, and then um, the Cavian Rose has six sacks to, to boot. And if they can get Athens behind the sticks in this game, it's going to go well for them, but that, that's going to be tough with a guy like Logan Fuller in the backfield. Right. I mean, if you want to beat a team like Athens, you have defensively, you're going to have to make them stay behind schedule, and that's making plays at or behind the line of scrimmage on first and second down. You know, force them into obvious passing downs, and I mean, that's not where Athens wants to be with their offense. They don't want to be have to, you know, they don't want to have to throw the ball um, to get their yards. So, you know, that's a contrasting styles right there. Van and Athens, um, you know, it very well could once again. Uh, lead to the district championship whoever wins this game ought to be ought to be fun to watch staying in 4a and 9 4a division one two old rivals uh knock helmets and that's carthage and henderson this i I really do feel like will be for the district championship when it's all said and done do you agree i completely agree with you um their bodies of work through the non-district schedule speak for themselves and um lots of lots of talent in this game and, and lots of bad feelings from years past uh, I know that both teams want to win, and I think that you're right. A win will give them the first seed in District 9-4A Division One. Yeah, I mean Carthage. Uh, you know they're three and two, but you know it's kind of misleading. The, you know their first loss of the season uh, was, was their season opener against Hallsville. Came in double overtime against a quality 5A program. Yeah, they went for a two point conversion and failed. Right, right. So, <laughs> so they were right there. I mean they were going for the win. You know, just sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. And then Henderson, you know, what can you say? I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of doubters, I think, coming into the season because of you know they're losing Zane Bowles and a few other their key contributors on, on the defensive side of the ball. But they're five and zero. Oh. You know, they're rocking and rolling. They're, they're, both teams are coming off their bye week, so both both teams should be well rested for this game. It should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. And then um, last but not least, in Class Three A Division One. We have another game that could potentially ultimately decide a district championship, and that is District 8 3A Division One. And we got to talk about White Oak versus Mineola. Yeah, I really do feel like this this is the game when, when you look at what the two teams have done and, and the history of this district and, and what the other teams in the league have been doing. It hasn't been great. Um, as soon as that state championship game was over between Mineola and Cameron, you know, I think we had the conversation like, man, this Mineola team, they could get back to the state championship. But they're not guaranteed their own district championship because nope. White Oak's in there. And, and White Oak's been impressive with a 4-1 record. Um, it, it's been strange for me. I've, I've heard a, a couple of people talk A couple of people talk like, yeah, but they lost to Bullard. But I, I think Bullard's a, a really good team, and it's a bigger team than them. Right, so right. <laughs> um, for Mineola, 
same same as always. Um, Jeremiah Crawford, the quarterback, and, and Chance Perkins are are the key players on offense. Plus the offensive tackles, Austin Riley Anderson committed to Texas A and M. I think White Oak's got a front that can counter that. Um, Swade Smith already has 13 tackles for loss, and there, there are a lot of guys like him. And when the when uh, White Oak goes to offense, I think that they've got a, a passing offense that can really test what's been an overall strong Mineola front. So I don't I don't know how this game's going to play out. It was a close game last year, if I'm not mistaken. It was a three point game mm-hmm. that Mineola was able to come out on top. Um, and you know. I don't think it's out of the question to expect either one of these two teams to possibly make a long run of the playoffs. I mean, you look at what Mineola did last year, and you look at what White Oak did the year before, yeah. getting all the way to the state semifinals, and you've got these two battle-tested programs who have you know a few hold- holdovers, at least White Oak does, from, from, from that team a couple of years ago. Um, you know, this should be an exciting game, and uh, you'll be the, you'll be on hand uh, in Mineola on Friday, correct? Looking You're, forward to yeah, it. Yeah, this, this ought to be this ought to be a. A fun, a fun game to, to uh, talk about maybe next week on the podcast. But uh, before we get to that, let's talk about uh, our players of the week. Uh, congratulations go out to Tyler Lee, sophomore quarterback Chance Amy, who is our offensive player of the week. And just his third start since uh, injured starter Zach Hall uh, left uh, in week three, Amy's really been rocking and rolling for, for Lee, and he's, he's had great, great games for, for Lee since stepping in last week against Lakeview Centennial. 13 of 23 passing for 323 yards and three touchdowns. If that wasn't enough, he added 115 yards on the ground and rushed for three more touchdowns, including the game winner late to help Lee secure its first district win of the season, 59-54. to 54. What a track meet that was. I mean, you were there. Yeah. Um, just uh, just incredible, incredible effort by Chance Amy to kind of help right the ship a little bit and make sure the Red Raiders didn't start off with catastrophe and that would be an 0-3 start in district. So and, congrats to him. And rumor has it that Zach Hall's injury may not be as bad as initially thought. So Yeah, that's true. <laughs> if, yeah, was, if he can stay, if he can help them survive right now, uh, Hall maybe can come back and get the job done at the end of the season. So I guess he's the Red Raiders version of Brandon Whedon. He's just got to hold down the fort until... Lee's Tony Romo, a.k.a. Zach Hall, is able to come back. So congratulations to Chance Tamey, our Offensive Player of the Week. Defensive Player of the Week goes to Winona linebacker Chase Boyd. Impressive performance from Mr. Boyd. 14 tackles and uh, four of those for loss and a 22-20 to win against Arp and sealed it with a blocked field goal, a 26-yard attempt uh, with 12 seconds left in the game. And, and that's huge for Winona, which jumped out to 2-0. and we, we, I don't think we were expecting that. Uh, especially against a team like ARP. So um, we're going to be watching the Wildcats pretty closely from here on out in um, District 8-3A Division Two. A couple of nice wins to begin district for sure with uh, Frankston and ARP. will be interesting to see if uh, Winona can keep it rolling. So congrats to our offensive and defensive players of the week, Chance Amy from Tyler Lee and Chase Boyd from Winona. Well, we're out of time for this week. Please check out ETSN.FM to get the latest info on all of this week's actions. we got game preview, stats, and standings. They're all online. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, uh, get with either me or Mike on Twitter. We are either at Clint Buckley or at Mike underscore ETSN. Once again, you've been listening to the ETSN.FM Week 7 Edition podcast. Join us again next week. And until then, have a great weekend.